Coming your way in an hour with Jed Surratt and Bob Beers here in the New England Honda Dealers 98.5 Sports Hope Bruins Radio Network. The Red Sox opened up series with Cleveland over at Fenway Park today in the annual Patriots Day game, and they lose the opener 6 to nothing. They're now 9-8 and eight on the season. We'll continue the series with Cleveland tomorrow. Today, the Patriots hosted Michigan quarterback J.J. McCarthy as we near the NFL draft. Now, his visit coming on the heels of uh, similar visits involving LSU QB Jaden Daniels and North Carolina's Drake May as part of this pre-draft process. And also, McCarthy's final pre-draft visit comes tomorrow and Wednesday when he'll be scheduled to meet with Washington. Philadelphia Eagles and wide receiver Devonta Smith have agreed to a three-year extension worth $75 million, $51 million guaranteed. Colts extending Pro Bowl defensive tackle to Forrest Buckner, reportedly adding two years, $46 million to his contract. Oklahoma City Thunder's Mark Daniel has been voted the National Basketball Coaches Association's NBA Coach of the Year, voting among the league's 30 head coaches. And John Sterling, the voice of the Yankees for the last 35 years, retiring effective immediately. Headlines are brought to you by... Roto-Rooter. Plumbing problems? Call Roto-Rooter. That's the name, and away go troubles down the drain. 1-800-GET-ROTO. That's 1-800-GET-ROTO. I'm Jim Murray for Boston's Home for Sports, 98.5 of Sports Hub. Kevin Majori's got you next in a half hour. Al Horford. Al Horford. This is Al Horford. Al Horford catching slap. Al Horford for three. You're listening to the home of Boston Celtics basketball, 98.5 The Sports Hub. You have dog crap in your system. This is the Baseball Hour with Tony Maz. They did nothing this offseason. Brought to you by Bigelow T, Gravely Zero Turn Lawnmowers, Corona, Jackson Lumber, Blue Moon Belgian White, Team Impact, and FindMassMoney.com. On 98.5 The Sports Hub. <laughs> Masa connecting for his first home run of the year yesterday in the victory over the Angels. And he'll hit a high pop to left. Quan again ranging, and he will make the catch, and that's the ball game. That's a real dud on Patriots Day. The Red Sox manage no offense. They commit a crucial late error, and the Guardians win it 6 to nothing. All right, that's the end of the Red Sox winning streak. Ends at uh, two games. They are now nine and eight on this season. Six to nothing losers to the Cleveland Guardians at Fenway Park today. Again, nine and eight. The Red Sox are after seventeen games. So here's where we're going to start tonight on the Baseball Hour. And let me just tell you quickly that it's an abbreviated program tonight. We have the Bruins coming up seven p.m. right here on ninety-eight five The Sports Hub. So Bruins pregame begins at 6.30 as a result. We are only with you for 30 minutes on this program tonight. i got a bunch of things I want to get to. I should mention also, by the way, the Bruins playing the uh, Washington Capitals tonight. Again, right here on our airwaves in 98.5, the Sports Hub. Uh, we'll open up the phone lines right away. A couple things I want to get to. First, the outcome of the game today, because I want to give you some alarming statistics about the Red Sox. That Alex Cora was asked about in today's game, and I'll get to the particulars here momentarily. Did you know, Jimmy Stewart, the Red Sox have been shut out three times already? I did. Three times. It's terrible. So I should know this without looking, but I couldn't find it in an easy spot. I'd love to see how many teams in baseball have been shut out more than the Red Sox have early in the year. Now, maybe Oakland, maybe the White Sox, who are terrible, maybe the Marlins, who are terrible. Oakland, oddly enough, is 8-9, and nine, I think, or 7-9. and nine. Like, the A's aren't as bad as the other two. I think the White Sox are something like 2-14 and 14 or 3-15 and 15 or some, something like that. So they've been horrendous. There's some bad teams out there in the major leagues this year. Three shutouts feels like a loss. A lot, rather. And I will add that the Red Sox have had three other games where they've only scored one run. So that's a third of their schedule, basically where they have scored zero or one run. Zero runs or one. Now, one of those one-run games was a win. They actually had a one-to-nothing victory in there. but uh, And that one was in Oakland. But you get the idea. Is the offense a concern? Cora was asked about uh, the offense overall. It's an exchange here with Sean McAdam of Mass Live. Uh, here it is. Go ahead, Jimmy. What did you see with the offense? Uh, we got beat to the spot with the fastball. Yeah, we, we hit the ball in the air, but lazy flat balls. Uh, he did a good job keeping away. 
Makes you know, the breaking uh, breaking pitches. Um, no, not much, not much. This is the third time you shut out in 17 games. In six games, it's one run or fewer. I know it's a small sample size, but is that a concern for you this early? No, I think uh, that that part of the game we should be fine. You know, uh, some guys that are scuffling right now, but we should be okay. Okay, Cora says he's not worried. They should be okay. Some guys are scuffling right now, but he thinks they'll be okay in that part of it. Jimmy Stewart, do you agree? No, they're kind of pork. They just lost Tyler O'Neill to an injury. Devers has missed games. I think that they need help. They desperately need help, and they can't field the ball either, but I know that's a side topic, but offensively, they're struggling, and they shouldn't be struggling like this. So, again, the offense, I do look at the offense, and I say, I'm not as convinced as Cora is that they're going to hit. Now, look, Devers, if he's healthy, and that, that I'm factoring in that he's dealt with a bad shoulder here early in the year, Devers I'm a little worried about because of the health. We all remember what it looked like a few years back when he had that bad elbow and really couldn't swing. That was at the end of the season. So if he has some sort of shoulder thing that is going to warrant attention and time off, then I do uh, question his ability to produce like he normally is. I think Casas is going to hit. O'Neal, if you uh, you heard Jimmy say earlier, O'Neal collided with Alex, I'm sorry, with Raphael Devers today. Got a cut across his forehead that required eight stitches. D- they knocked heads, basically, in a ball into the short outfield. And so, you know, I, I don't think O'Neal's going to play tomorrow. It might not be long for him to be out, but you get the idea. Trevor Story, whom I don't love as an offensive player to begin with, but he was good against left-handed pitching. He is gone. So now let me just give you the numbers, and then we'll get to your calls. In batting average right now, the Red Sox rank 24th in the majors. In on-base average, they rank 22nd. In slugging percentage, they rank 21st. And that is true despite the fact that they have hit a bunch of home runs. I think they're 6th in the majors in home runs, and yet 21st in slugging. Because they don't put the play, uh, ball in play a lot. They strike out a lot. And I should look where they rank in doubles because I can't imagine that they're very highly ranked in doubles, which is probably why uh, they're in the position they're in. They have 19 doubles in the uh, 23rd in the majors. Okay, so again, they got to be way down there. It, it, it just makes sense that their slugging wouldn't be high because of uh, despite the fact they have home runs. So you add it all up, OPS, they're 22nd. They have struck out the second most times in baseball behind only the Los Angeles Dodgers. And you would say, well, the Dodgers are good. The Dodgers also have played more games than the Red Sox because, again, of the Korea trip to open the year. So the Red Sox really have struck out at a higher rate than any other team in the big leagues. And did you know that they're number one in the majors and caught stealing? So while they have 14 steals, they've been thrown out eight times. So, low batting average, low on base, low slugging, low OPS, high strikeout rate, and they get thrown out stealing a lot. Not a good combination of things uh, if you're looking for that. Now, I will add one other thing to the discussion. I know some of you might have some thoughts. I mentioned this at the beginning of Felger and Mass. Larry Lucchino's funeral last week, I attended. I knew that day that John Henry and... Uh, Tom Werner were not there. Linda Pizzuti was there. I presume to represent ownership. Theo Epstein was there. The mayor of Boston was there. But again, Henry and Werner were not. Jimmy Stewart, you tell me, should the owners have been there for Larry Lucchino's funeral? 100% yes. Okay, I feel the same way. And the only possible excuse I can come up with is that is if, first of all, if there's some sort of serious illness or something, then fine, that's different. Wasn't it described as a minor illness? Okay, so that was, I think it, it was a it was a cold or something like that. Put a mask on. Okay, so that's, that's you know, but, but sometimes with team owners, things of the like, if it is more serious, they won't tell us. Okay, and I, I'm not telling you, I, I didn't raise this at 2 o'clock. I probably should have. And uh, I haven't had any correspondence with, with anybody in between now and then. So this just popped into my head. But to me, really, the only reason to not be there is if the Lucchino family said, we don't want you there. 
We don't want you there. Otherwise, they should have been there. And uh, now, again, is it some sort of egregious blunder? No, but if they weren't there, I do think it's a story either way. But if Theo was there and Theo and Larry had issues, which we all believe that they did, the owners like Tom and John can't be there. That's just unacceptable. They have they have private jets. They can be there. They made a choice not to be unless they weren't invited. But why wouldn't they be invited? Well, Jimmy, because ownership and Larry Lucchino had issues at the end, too. So, you know, it wasn't exactly as public as Theo, but Larry Lucchino did not retire. Okay, Larry Lucchino was pushed out. So, now, if that's the case, it is entirely possible that the Lucchino family said, we don't want you here. Now, I doubt it. So, I, I, I just, I, to, honestly, I think it's something that Henry and Werner should address. But then why did Linda show up? Okay, good question, Jimmy. Good question. Excellent point. Uh, 617-779-0985. Dean and Shrewsbury. Dean, what do you got? Uh, I think that they need to revert Brian Bayo's pitch mix back to what it was the beginning of last season. He was throwing more circle change, four seam and two seam. Uh, his ERA, the beginning of the first half of last season was 304. Then they wanted to mix in the slider, the sweeper, and more of this breaking stuff, and it was about 550. And now this year's 394. Three of his four home runs have come on this sweeper slash slider, and I just don't think it's a good idea to have that pitch mix for him. I know they want more breaking stuff, but I don't think it's his forte. So, Dean, I agree with you, and I'll, I'll just add this to the list on the pitching, which I kind of went off on at the end of last week. I hate the way they pitch. I hate it. Can't stand it. And by the way, when Alex Cora was asked in that cut that we played for, from Sean McAdam at the beginning, is there anything you see with the – Jimmy, let's play it again. Is there anything you see with the offense? Okay, listen to Cora's answer. What did you see with the offense? Uh, we got beat to the spot with the fastball. Stop. Uh, they got beat to the spot with the fastball. Interesting concept. You mean the other team actually throws fastballs and catches you off guard and puts you on your heels and you can't catch up? Huh, funny. And I'm not blaming Core for this because I question whether Core is on, uh, you know, in, in alignment with it or on board with it. Cora feels like the kind of me that would like to establish the fastball and then work everything else around it. And Jimmy, uh, Jimmy Stewart, our producer here, brought up the point last week too, which I loved. Whatever happened to actually changing location instead of just throwing 15 sliders in a row? Fastball up, fastball down, fastball in. Fastball pushes the guy off the plate. What, what is the aversion out of the fastball? Why don't teams throw it anymore? And the Red Sox aren't alone. But it does feel like some teams out there still pitch with the fastball. Maybe the Red Sox just have pitchers who suck at controlling and commanding it. Is that possible? And that's why they don't throw the fastball? And Bayo, by the way, gave up another lead the other day if we're going to bring that up. How many, time, how many times this year is that guy going to give up a lead? Six. <laughs> that was just a gratuitous answer, Jimmy, just to shove it in my face. <laughs> but I can't say, but I kind of found it funny. 617-779-0985. We'll continue with your uh, calls when we come back. And also, the collision between Tyler O'Neill and Raphael Devers. We'll have that for you, too, in the baseball hour. Stay tuned for more.
from I'm not trying to be cute by that. But the the collision that takes place like the one today where guys knock heads is legitimately scary. Those are legitimately scary collisions when guys knock heads like that. And anybody who's watched the Red Sox for a long period of time will remember the one in the playoffs years ago. Johnny Damon collided with Damian Jackson, who was a, uh, I'm going to call him a backup infielder, utility guy, but also started a lot of games at second base for the Red Sox that year. They smashed heads. uh, Damian Jackson was running back towards the outfield. And in that case, he wasn't backpedaling. He was running forward or even sideways. Damon was coming in and they couldn't hear one another. And Jackson's uh, head smashed Johnny Damon right in the face. I mean, it was as violent a collision as I think I've ever seen. Damon got taken off on a stretcher. In any case, you know, it just evoked memories of that. This was different because Devers was backing up. O'Neal came in and the back of Devers' head hit O'Neal. They were moving far slower than Damian Jackson and Damon were. In any case, uh, Tyler O'Neal ended up with stitches. Eight stitches. Cora was it. It sounds like the Red Sox dodged a bullet. Devers stayed in the game. So, but given the issues the Red Sox have had here early in the year with the number of people that have been out, especially in the infield, Devers missed time with his shoulder. Vaughn Grissom's been out. Story's obviously been lost for the year. Tyler O'Neill's probably been the Red Sox' best player. So he left the game. They're going to lose him for at least a day or two. But uh, Cora did sound actually kind of optimistic on the whole thing. So here's Cora after the game. From your vantage point, how scary was this, the initial collision? Um, I mean, scary. Yeah, you, you said it right. But uh, you know, when I got there, Rafi was okay. I saw the blood, you know. But uh, hopefully both of them are okay. And uh, they'll be ready, you know, uh, Rafi tomorrow. And we'll see you too. Okay. So, uh, you know, he says Rafi, meaning Devers should be able to play tomorrow night. My guess is O'Neal's going to miss a day. He'll have some swelling. Uh, and those stitches are going to be fresh. I don't know what the protocol there is. So it feels to me like they wouldn't send him out there right away with stitches. Maybe he'll play. They'll bandage it up and he'll play. Feels like a tough guy, competitive guy. I mentioned it just because it feels like they're in no position to be undermanned. Okay, it's a light roster by Red Sox standards to begin with. They've already lost Story. They've already lost Giolito. Pavetta's on the DL. Kenley Jansen feels like a breakdown waiting to happen. Grissom's out. You get the idea. They just feel any injuries could really tilt them in a horrible direction. Jansen is trying so hard to be put on the injured list, Tony. It's incredible everything he's trying to do to get out of here. Which is another thing I'll add to the discussion. Again, we have a short program tonight, so we're done in a matter of minutes here for Bruins pregame at 6.30. Jansen complained about the baseballs the other day, neglecting to, to mention that everybody's pitching with the same balls. Now, why is he averaging 13 walks per nine innings? Because I think he didn't pitch enough in spring training. He's probably out of shape, and he's probably out of whack mechanically on top of it. He's blaming the baseballs. Feels like a cop-out. Our buddy Tony in Stoneham. Tony, what do you got? Hey, guys, I got something for you. I, I, I cannot believe this is what's going on with this team. That this guy, Cass, he hits a home run the other day. And then he questions that they did not measure Ted Williams' 502 foot home run 80 years ago because he says he hit the ball harder. This is where their mind is. This team is ridiculous. So, Tony, in his defense, I think he was asked about the red seat. Now, look, I'll, I'll tell you that Casas hit the ball 429. I mean, I've seen longer home runs than that out to right field at Fenway. You don't see many that, that clear the uh, runways that go down to the concourse and the concession areas. I remember one specifically by Sean Green many, many years. It's always stuck with me because he hit it so freaking far. And Ortiz has hit him out to that triangle beyond the bullpen, which, again, is a smash. 502, I'm with Casas on this. I think it's a myth. But that doesn't mean it was four, you know, four oh two. It might have been four fifty. But you know, and I'm not sure why it's relevant. Four twenty nine is long, but it's not that long. I mean, look up the ha- longest home runs in baseball last year. I bet four twenty wasn't within fifty feet of it. 
Tony, Josh Hamilton hit one off Mark Melanson that was 470. I sent you the video. Take a look at how far that gets and how far away from it the red seed it is. Okay. So that, and that's my point about the red seed. I think the red seed is a myth. And that one was 470. Uh, Steve and Carver. Steve, what do you got? Josh Hamilton. Maz, no excuses with John Henry. He was at the game today. So what? He's sick a couple of days ago, and now he can show his face. And by the way, nice product, John Henry. You couldn't even sell out Marathon Monday. This is a marquee game on their schedule, and they announced it wasn't a sellout. 70-degree weather. City is packed. No one's there yesterday. No one's there today. It's an absolute disgrace. And Kenley Jansen, get off my team. You're obese. That's why you suck at pitching. Okay, so Steve, I don't know that I would say nobody was there. I think the attendance was listed at 33,000. Most cities will take that. But capacity at Fenway Park is 37.5. It is typically a sellout. Now, again, they block off the seats in day games, so it's a little less than that. Uh, I don't know how many seats they block off, Jimmy. It's got to be, what, 1,000 seats out there? In yeah, it's not many. Okay, so but even so, they didn't hit the number today. Patriots Day is typically a guaranteed sellout. You know, they weren't, uh, they may have technically sold out on opening day. And, and I'll also tell you that the number you're seeing in the box score is a ticket sold number. Because the ticket sold yesterday was 30,000 or were 30,000. But I would tell you that there were fewer people in the ballpark. There were lots of uh, photos and whatnot on Twitter indicating that the ballpark wasn't full. So I'm not buying into that number. Quickly, Martin in Texas. Martin, what do you got? Hey, Tony, I just want to say I thought that collision was an omen because the very next inning, <clears throat> Raffaella was subbed at, was subbed into center field and David Hamilton immediately made an error on the last defensive play. So I'm not surprised. I mean, this is – David Hamilton to me is not a big league shortstop. I hope I'm wrong. I hope we're just getting a bad sample here, but I don't see – I don't think he has the arm to be on that side of the diamond, frankly. Uh, that's it for the baseball hour tonight. As I said, Bruins pregame coming up next. Judd Surratt, Bob Beers. They'll have the game for you shortly thereafter. 7 p.m. puck drop against the Washington Capitals. We'll catch you tomorrow.